Hello. Do you hear me? Yes. Okay. <laughs> That's good to know. Um, first of all, um, I want to express how impressed I, I am by the, the story we just heard. It's, it's really humbling, um, and it's also a, a strong motivation to move forward with the science um, the best we can. Um, what I'm going to do today is not talk about TMJ because I don't know anything about it, but I do know a little bit about how inflammation and the immune system contribute to pain and also to some of the comorbidities. Um, so I, I think nowadays it's quite well accepted that not only um, chronic pain, but also a lot of the associated uh, problems that patients with chronic pain experience um, can be linked to what is often called chronic low-grade inflammation. Um, and so we know that um, le higher levels of inflammatory cytokines can be found um, in the periphery in patients suffering from fatigue. It can lead to or contribute to sleep changes, cognitive impairment, depression, and also chronic pain. And it's thought that this is all due to changes in the expression of inflammatory cytokines in the central nervous system, both in the brain and in the spinal cord. Um, and so when we think about that, many um, attempts have been, have been done to suppress um, that chronic inflammation uh, in order to treat the symptoms that I just mentioned. So not only chronic pain, but also all the associated symptoms. And although there has been some short-term success for some of them, Overall, we can say that immunosuppression with steroids or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are not sufficient to solve these problems, which is a bit surprising if we think that the inflammation that we see contributes to all of these problems. So the hypothesis that my lab came to was, well, what if the immune system or the inflammatory system, if you wish, contributes to both the problem as well as the solution here? And I think if, if we take a step back and think about how we think about things like pain or depression or fatigue, um, we often tend to think that there is some kind of insult, a surgery, um, an infection, uh, some wound of, of one sort or the other that induces pain um, and if it lasts longer may even induce some kind of sickness behavior, fatigue, depression, um, all of these symptoms that I mentioned. And we think that once the, the wound is healed or the inflammation is cleared or the infection um, is no longer around, then there is a phase when there is spontaneous recovery. Um, and what I would like to argue is that that is actually not how it goes. What I think is that even after the wound has healed or the, the effects of the surgery um, are gone, you need to engage an endogenous mechanism a, that, that causes, that actively induces the recovery or the resolution. And I'm going to show some data uh, to support this claim. Now, why is that important? Well, it means that if you have a problem with those endogenous re resolution mechanisms, if for one reason or another you are an individual who is not as good or whose body is not as good, at engaging, engaging these mechanisms, you will develop persistent pain because you don't um, recover. The other thing is, if, if there is such a thing as an endogenous resolution mechanism and we know what it is, then theoretically, if we would be able to activate those endogenous resolution mechanisms in patients who have chronic pain or other issues, um, we should be able not only to control the symptoms, but also resolve the underlying mechanism and leading to full recovery. So that is sort of the larger perspective from where I work. That is the idea that I'm pursuing. Um, what I will do today is I will you sh uh, show you examples in two different models. One is a model of chemotherapy-induced neuropathic pain, but we have very similar data as what I show you here. Um, for inflammatory pain, where um, we see that um, there is an active mechanism required for resolution. Now, the reason we selected chemotherapy-induced neuropathic pain is, is because it's a very common adverse side effect of cancer treatments, and I work in a cancer clinic after all. 
Um, and more importantly, although in most patients after completion of, of treatment, the pain will resolve um, spontaneously, there is a, a significant subgroup of patients that will develop chronic pain after completion of treatment. So they, there the pain does not resolve and we don't really know um, who will be those patients, what is causing that and what the mechanisms are. The other model I want to talk about today is um, the pressure-like behavior induced by inflammation. And that is because major depressive disorder is often associated with peripheral inflammation. It often is comorbid with chronic pain. And we know that peripheral inflammation is sufficient to cause symptoms of depression. So all this goes into this idea that, okay, you induce a certain problem, in our case in a mouse model, um, and you expect it to resolve spontaneously. And I want to know what are the factors that really promote that resolution. So the first model I want to show you is the chemotherapy-induced uh, pain. Um, on the y-axis, you see the withdrawal threshold. So anything going down means the animal is more sensitive to pain. If we treat them with a chemotherapeutic, the mice will, de oops, the mice will develop pain. And after a while, they'll re spontaneously recover. If we do exactly the same in mice that have an abnormality in their immune system because they don't have a certain class of lymphocytes, the T lymphocytes, what you can see here is that even though we give them the same treatment and they initially develop the same level of pain, those mice will not recover. We see the same when we look at um, a measure of depression-like behavior induced by uh, inflammation. So here, higher on the y-axis is more immobility in a forced swim test, and that is a measure of learned helplessness that we interpret as depression-like behavior. So if you make them sick with LPS, uh, the first 12 to 14 hours they won't do a whole lot, but then it's the next day we test them in this um, forced swim test, and you see in green that the, the LPS-treated animals um, are more immobile. They struggle less to get out of the water. Um, and that behavior resolves about 72 hours after the injection. If we do the same again in mice that don't have T cells, you see again what we saw for the pain. Mice that don't have T lymphocytes initially show the same behavior as everybody else. However, they do not um, recover after 72 hours. So here again, they apparently miss a mechanism that is crucial for the resolution of pain and of depression. Now we know for sure that this is really the T cells because if we take the same mice that don't have T cells and then give them T cells, you can see here in blue that they now behave as if they were normal mice. Same for the depression model. So you see the prolonged um, depression and the prolonged pain in mice that don't have T lymphocytes, but as soon as they have T lymphocytes, they behave completely normal. Okay, so this is interesting for a number of reasons. So one, it tells you that resolution of pain is really an active mechanism. It's not something that automatically uh, appear or happens when the driver goes away. Um, it also is interesting because T cells are the cells that you target with vaccination. So T cells can develop memory for something they have done before and become better at that job. So we wanted to know whether we can also educate T lymphocytes to promote recovery of pain in, in our cisplatin model. So what we did is we had a group of mice that we treated with cisplatin. We let them go through pain and recovery. These are the normal mice that do recover. Um, and compared the T cells of these mice um, with T cells from mice that hadn't gone through any pain and recovery at all, the control T cells. So we have now educated T cells, T cells who have done the job before, and control T cells. And then we give these cells to our mice that don't have T lymphocytes and treat them with chemotherapy. And what you see if you do that, um, here in blue is what we saw before. If mice do have T cells, they develop pain in response to cisplatin um, and then recover. If we give them T cells that have already done the job once, you see that these T cells are now protected. So we can fully prevent the development of this chemotherapy-induced pain. And this is not only true when we treat them with cisplatin, but also with a totally different chemotherapeutic that works by a totally different mechanism, but also induces pain. So if you give them normal T cells, the mice will recover. 
Um, but if you give them T cells that have um, resolved pain before, you can see that we can completely protect them. So I hope this is the first step towards convincing you that this recovery that we expect after the insult is gonna, has gone away is an active mechanism that involves T cells. And we hope in the long term that we can develop ways to train these T cells ex vivo so that we can give them to patients before they undergo a risky surgery or before um, they undergo chemotherapy in order to have a preventive effect. But of course that is um, a long way to go still. Now, of course, the obvious question then is, how do T cells control resolution of pain and depression? And I will start with depression here. So in the model that we use to induce depression, um, we know quite well what the sequence of events is that leads to this depression-like behavior in these mice. We know that the inflammation we induce uh, gives rise to pro-inflammatory cytokines, interferon gamma, TNF-alpha, IL-1 beta, both in the periphery and in the brain. In the brain, these cytokines induce the expression of this enzyme, IDO1, um, and that um, promotes the metabolism of tryptophan into kynuronin, and this is a crucial step, because if mice don't have this enzyme, they will not develop depression in response to LPS. Okay, so we first looked at this enzyme. Do you need T cells? in order to control the expression of this enzyme? And the answer is yes. So I will walk you through this uh, figure. Here we looked at the level of this enzyme that is inducing the depressed-like behavior in mice that have an inflammation. And what you can see is that 72 hours after um, the induction of the inflammation, when our wild-type mice here in green have normal behavior again, we no longer detect this enzyme in the brain. We actually only detect it in the brain of mice that don't have T lymphocytes, um, and those are the ones that still show the depression-like behavior. So yes, you need T cells in order to control the expression of this enzyme. And specifically, you need it to make sure that the expression of the enzyme goes down again after the peripheral inflammation has resolved. Now, our hypothesis was that the T cells would do that job via controlling the expression of the pro-inflammatory cytokines that are produced by the microglia in the brain. However, when we looked at the expression of these cytokines, again at the 72-hour time point, we can see that everybody who was treated with LPS still has high levels of interferon gamma and IL-1 beta, but there is no difference between the groups that do or don't have um, still the depression-like behavior or the ideal one, because those are only the ones in red here. So apparently the T cells are not contributing to controlling the pro-inflammatory cytokines. Um, so then we said, well, maybe it's the counteracting group of cytokines or anti-inflammatory cytokines or regulatory cytokines, if you wish. And we measured a number of them in the brain, again at that same time point, 72 hours after LPS. And what you can see here is that um, the cytokine interleukin-10 is upregulated in the brain of our control mice and of our mice that, we, that originally did not have T cells but that we gave T cells. So it looks like you need IL-10 in order to control that depression-like behavior because the only ones that don't have the behavior anymore have IL-10 and the group that doesn't recover doesn't make IL-10 in the brain because it has no T cells. Okay, so to check whether that is really an important factor, the next thing we did is we said, okay, let's test this hypothesis that IL-10 is needed to control IDO1 expression in the brain and thereby promote the resolution of depression. And indeed what we see is in vitro, in this case, if you take microglia, and you induce that enzyme, IDO1, you get a, a decent amount. But if you now also add IL-10, you can see that we can suppress the expression of that enzyme that you need to induce the depression-like behavior. In addition, we said, okay, if this is the case, then we should be able to prolong the depression in normal mice if we block IL-10 signaling in the brain. So what we did is we gave these 
uh, animals an antibody against interleukin-10 via the nose. And the idea was, okay, if we do that, they will not recover from depression. They will develop prolonged depression. Now, first of all, we show that now if we give them anti-IL-10, so we, we block the mechanism that controls the enzyme that induces the depression, we indeed fa fail to see the decrease in IDO1 at 72 hours after LPS. And we also see that now these animals have prolonged depression-like behavior. So apparently this model is correct. It looks as if if you have an inflammation that makes you sick and makes you feel depressed, that is all good and well. Um, normally that is terminated via the action of interleukin-10, which then controls the pathway that leads to the depression. And interestingly, a very similar mechanism involving slightly different players seems to be involved um, in the brain. Uh, sorry, in the periphery and control uh, the pain pathway. So what we know is that when we induce the chemotherapy-induced neuropathy that normally resolves, but now give an antibody against IL-10, we prolong the pain. And this is because there are receptors for interleukin-10 on dorsal root ganglion neurons that you need in order to resolve pain. So if you don't have IL-10 receptors in your neurons in the periphery, you also develop prolonged pain as a mouse. So in summary, what I hope I showed you is that depression and chronic pain are both associated with inflammation, um, and that is well known. Um, I think immunosuppression with steroids or anti-inflammatory drugs is not sufficient to solve the problem because you need the inflammatory system also to promote resolution. In other words, the immune system contributes not only to the problem, but is also part of the solution. Um, and that would mean that we need totally different strategies if we want to control chronic pain, including maybe education of T cells, uh, maybe stimulating our sense signaling, or even a combination of suppressing the inflammatory pathways and at the same time promoting this resolution pathway. Um, and of course, we, if, once we know exactly what these T cells do and how they regulate our TEN signaling, um, we might use um, this as a biomarker to predict who will develop chronic problems and who will recover. And then this is the, the team that did all the work, um, specifically uh, Geoffroy Lomer, Karen Krukowski, and my long-term collaborators, Kobe Heinen and Robert Denson. Thank you.